During spring break, I got into a habit of speaking with strangers on Omegle. I hail from a small city and don't have much of a social life, so the idea of speaking with strangers from across the world seemed captivating to me. That's how I came across Natasha. There was something captivating about her. It wasn't just her beauty, which was undeniable, but the way she spoke, her lively gestures, and that infectious smile. She leaned against a plain beige wall, its monotony a stark contrast to her vivid persona. Our conversation flowed effortlessly as well, traversing through a myriad of topics. She had an opinion on just about everything, from the intricacies of modern art to the complexities of astrophysics, and her insights were as enchanting as her laughter. But amidst our engaging dialogue, something peculiar kept happening. Every few minutes, Natasha's eyes would dart to her right, her animated expression freezing momentarily. It was like a glitch in reality, a brief interruption in an otherwise seamless stream. The first time it happened, I assumed it was just a distraction, something off camera catching her attention. But as our conversation progressed, these pauses became more frequent and more pronounced. I tried to ignore it, focusing instead on the charm of her conversation. But the interruptions grew increasingly unsettling. It was as if she wasn't just looking at something or someone, but rather responding to an unseen presence. Each pause was followed by a slight change in her demeanor, a subtle shift from relaxed to slightly tense, as if she was under some unseen pressure or something. Driven by a mix of concern and curiosity, I finally broached the subject. Hey, is someone there with you? I asked, attempting to keep my voice light. My mind, though, was swirling with possibilities. The question seemed to trigger something. Natasha glanced to her right again, but this time, the pause was longer, more deliberate. It looked like she was paralyzed for a few seconds. She looked back at the camera, and the usual warmth in her eyes had been replaced by a palpable sense of fear. Her voice, once lively and confident, was now a hushed whisper, trembling with underlying dread. No one, she said. But the way she said it, it was as if each word was a struggle, a fight against some invisible force. Before I could react, she abruptly ended the chat. The screen went blank, leaving me staring at my own confused reflection in the darkened monitor. I replayed the conversation in my mind, each of her pauses now taking on a more sinister tone. Who or what had she been looking at? Was she in danger or was it all just an elaborate act? For days. The mystery of this Omega encounter with Natasha haunted me. Her face would appear in my dreams, always turning to look at something just out of sight, her expression morphing from joy to terror. I scoured the internet, doing my best to try to find her again, but it was as if she had vanished into thin air. Then, unexpectedly, I came across her again. This time, she introduced herself as Kate, the same beautiful smile the same engaging conversation against the same nondescript beige wall. But she had no recollection of our previous encounter. My mind reeled with confusion and disbelief. How could she not remember? We had shared a connection, or so I had thought. I tried to convince her, recounting details of our previous conversation, but she looked at me with genuine bewilderment. Doubt crept into my mind. Had I really spoken to her before, or had my mind played tricks on me somehow? But then, just like before, she paused mid-sentence, her gaze shifting to the right, her face going blank for those agonizing five seconds. The familiarity of the action sent a chill down my spine. The same inexplicable pause, and the same subtle look of fear when she resumed. It was exactly the same. It was more than a mere coincidence. It was a pattern a disturbing repetition of the same eerie behavior. As the realization of the situation's gravity sank in, my mind raced with theories and questions. Was this a case of mistaken identity or something far more sinister? Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to take a more proactive approach. We continued our conversation, me feigning normalcy while my brain worked overtime. I was careful not to alarm her or whoever might have been watching her. Excusing myself for a moment, I grabbed a pen and paper from my desk. My hands trembled as I scribbled my first question, my heart pounding against my chest. Holding the paper up to the camera, I tried to keep my expression neutral. The note read, Is someone watching you? If yes, 
fake a sneeze. I watched her face intently, looking for any sign of recognition or understanding. For a moment, nothing happened, and I feared my attempt might be in vain. But then, she sneezed. It was subtle, almost too perfect, but it was a response. A mix of relief and horror washed over me. She was in trouble, and someone was indeed watching her. I quickly wrote another note. Can he harm you? Once again, I held it up, my eyes locked on the screen. She sneezed again, her eyes briefly meeting mine with a look that conveyed a silent plea for help. My mind was racing. I needed to know more, to understand the extent of the danger she was in. I wrote another question, my hand shaking. Can he kill you? I held the note up, feeling like I was in some twisted game of charades where the stakes were life and death. This time, when she sneezed, a single tear rolled down her cheek. The sight of it shattered any remaining doubts I had. She was in mortal danger, and I was helplessly watching it unfold through a computer screen. Suddenly, the camera shook violently. It seemed as if the person behind the scenes had realized something was amiss. I heard muffled sounds, a struggle perhaps, and then the camera lifted, giving me a brief chaotic glimpse of her surroundings. My heart stopped. The room she was in was a mirror image of my own. The same beige walls, the same bed with its distinctive headboard, even the curtains matched mine. How was this possible? Had someone recreated my room in another location? The familiarity of it was all disorienting, making me question my own reality. Then, the camera turned, and I was faced with the most horrifying sight yet. The man holding the camera, the one who had been watching her, turned it to reveal his face. It was my own face staring back at me. Not just a resemblance, but an exact uncanny duplication. His smile was grotesque, twisted in a way that my own face had never been. It was a demonic grin, one that spoke of malevolence and insanity. The eyes, though, identical to mine, held a darkness that was otherworldly. A stark contrast to the familiar features they were a part of. Panic and confusion overwhelmed me. Was this some sort of doppelganger? A twisted twin I never knew I had? Or was it something more supernatural? A demonic entity that had taken my likeness for some nefarious purpose? As these questions swirled in my head, the screen went black. The connection was lost, leaving me in a state of shock and disbelief. I sat there, staring at the blank screen, my mind struggling to process what I had just witnessed. The image of the demonic version of myself haunted me. A chilling reminder that somewhere out there, something wearing my face was doing unspeakable things. The fate of the woman, Natasha or Kate, whoever she was, remained unknown. A tragic mystery wrapped in a nightmarish enigma. Who was she really? And who or what was the being that shared my face? And it was then that I heard a demonic voice coming from my room. A voice that shook me to my bones. Aren't you going to join us? It was the day Omegle had to shut down. The allegations put forward over the decade of its existence had left the company embezzled with thousands of court cases. And the company had to file for bankruptcy. I lost my job that day. I was in charge of maintaining the code base of the website and was also assisted with the customer support team. It meant I practically had no knowledge of the legal side of things up until it was publicly announced. It was the final day in the office. I was finishing collecting my things and packing them into a tray to return home with. It reminded me of cleaning out my locker at the end of the school year. The office is practically empty by this point. I was one of the last ones left as I had to upload the goodbye message onto the website, explaining to people why Omegle had vanished. Once finished collecting my stuff, I looked back, reminiscing on my time there. The place used to be so lively, full of excitement. Now, it's empty and lifeless. I closed the front door on my way out for the final time, walked over to my car, took a step back, and stared up at the office block. Half a decade of my life had been spent working here. I felt miserable leaving it. I drove off, a few tears pouring from my eyes as I realized it was finally time to move on. But just 10 minutes into the drive, I went to reach for my phone to play some music, only to realize it was back at the office. It was getting dark, 
and I usually wouldn't stay in the city past the sunset, but my phone was certainly worth going back for. In a swift motion, I turned the car around and after just 20 minutes of driving, I was back. As I wandered towards the front door, I was slightly shocked to see the door was left slightly ajar. I swore I closed it, but there was every chance the tears blurred my memory just as they had done my vision. By this point, the sun had completely set. It was winter, so the days were far shorter. The darkness seemed to swallow the building, as nobody worked there anymore. There was no need for nighttime lights. Walking inside, I made my way up the stairs and into the central office area, feeling indifferent to my surroundings. They seemed strange to me now, distant even. The office was empty. Every single desk was ransacked of personal belongings. Sighing, I dragged my feet over to my old desk where my phone was sitting. It glowed brightly as I picked it up. As I turned around, I turned the flashlight on as it was a little too dark for my taste, only to reveal countless sheets of paper strewn all over the floor beside me. It came as quite a surprise to me, considering I had been there just 20 minutes before when the place was clean, almost back to when the company first bought it. I moved my flashlight around, revealing that the paper led towards a tipped over file cabinet opposite my desk. That's when I saw the empty bottle of vodka. A few drops of the stuff were still dripping onto the floor below. My skin crawled. Was somebody here? I had thought. I went over to the light switch, flicking it on. Again, to my surprise, the switch did nothing. The power company must have already severed the building's electricity now that nobody worked there. I continued to scan the room with the flashlight. The place looked like a bomb site. Desks had been flung over everywhere and piles upon piles of folders lay scattered all across the floor. It was at that point that the one responsible for the mess made himself known. My heart fell as I heard a loud groan erupt from one of the main offices towards the other end of the room. I looked over to where the sound seemed to have originated from, only to find that the door to one of the manager's office was left wide open. As I moved towards it, I saw that there was a dim light leaking from it. As I crept towards it, my eyes bore witness to some of the papers on the floor that were leading towards the open door. I turned my phone to light them up. On almost every page, there was a court case with a picture attached. I can't bring myself to describe them in much detail. I can only say they were grotesque and utterly despicable images. Leaning down, I read some of the allegations made by some of Omegle's users. Again, It seems insensitive to repeat exactly what I saw, but Predator seemed to come up more than enough to rationalize the company's central issues. I had some idea of the allegations, but to see them in the flesh made me feel sick. My stomach churned as I rose back up, resuming my journey to the mystery door. Eventually, I reached the office where the sounds were coming from. They had been repeating the whole time, groan after groan, low, like an animal. Peering in, I had my phone in my hand with 911 on the dial at the ready. I had no idea what was inside, but to keep myself safe, I decided the precaution was more than worth it. Even now, I don't know what drove me to stay. I could have just walked away. That place wasn't my problem anymore. But for some reason, my loyalty stayed. Inside, I recognized the face of one of my managers, drunk, blood oozing from one of his eyes. All around him were those same revolting images I had just seen scattered all over the hallway. Pages and pages of complaints, all evidence with images of fully grown men doing utterly intolerable things. It was at that moment that I realized my flash had come into the room with me. The manager slowly started to look up. He gouged one of his eyes out. Instantly I leapt back, slapping my finger on the call button as I watched in horror as the manager stood up, trying to stumble towards me. My eyes traveled all over his body before focusing on what he was holding in his hand. There was a knife grip between his fingers with bits of his eyes dripping off of it. Adrenaline surged through me as I backed out of the room and started bolting towards the exit door. From behind, I could hear him yelling at me. Get back here! 
You've seen too much! Luckily, I was easily able to outrun the drunken mess and even managed to lock him inside. As I held my body against the front door from the outside, I heard him charge into the door over and over, wailing. A couple of minutes passed before the police finally arrived. They head inside, and after just five minutes, my eyes widen with terror as they wheel out the manager's corpse in a stretcher. He died from blood loss. He cut out the other eye. It was discovered later that they had found a note with his dead body. The note explained that the manager felt responsible for all the atrocities committed throughout Omega's lifetime. He simply couldn't bear to look at it. Couldn't bear to live with it. I have a copy of the note. I read it over almost every day, staring at the final part of the note. It says that he wasn't the only one responsible. There were... There are others, too. I took a shaky breath before starting. I was so used to pretending to be distraught that it was second nature to me to hunch my shoulders and look as if I'd been crying for hours by then. A few people skipped me, which made sense, but then I saw her. Large, worried brown eyes burrowed into mine. Perfect. With trembling hands, I held Emma's photo close to my chest before briefly showing it to the camera. For a second, I thought that girl was about to end our conversation, too. But then, her gaze softened. Oh, hi. Are you okay? Wait, I can actually just talk to you. Are you well? No. I... To be honest, I'm on here for a good reason. I flashed her a smile, weak and barely there. It's been three months since my girlfriend Emma disappeared. I have been looking for her for so long, but she's nowhere to be seen. A well-timed sob invoked a sad look. Great. The authorities are refusing to do anything, so I'm looking for people here, but I I'm sure you're busy. No, I'll help. My brother went missing six years ago, and he never came back. The tears in her eyes made me want to squeeze her tight to my chest. What a catch. The chick was seriously adorable. Still, I kept my act. See, I'm just not attractive enough to score a woman by any other means. Sob stories work, though. And, well, the one about Emma wasn't exactly a lie. What can I help you with? I mean, are there any plans to go and search for her, or...? Just as she finished her sentence, I prepared to answer her. I was quite good at that part of the conversation used to explaining well the need to meet someone face to face, but my image on the camera froze all of a sudden. Hello there, Jacob. Huh? Is this some sort of prank? Are you okay? You're staring ahead like, Jacob. I blinked once, then twice. The messages disappear from the screen. It takes me a moment to gather myself. I needed a second to gather myself, but it was okay. All I needed was another chick to open her heart to me, but fate had other plans. Jacob, sorry, I think our connection was lost or something. Yeah, it was kind of ironic. I flipped through a couple of gross men trying to hit on me. Dudes, I'm a dude, and well, ended up on Dora again. To be fair, she was quite pretty. I've been spending most of my money on finding Emma, so my internet isn't all that good. Liar. Again, I saw it. The messages pop up in the chat window. I swallowed hard. If Dora was the one calling me a liar, why was she staring at me with such an empathetic look? I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> what the? I'm sorry, but I think something's wrong with my computer. That's okay. Would you prefer to meet up, maybe? I'd be super happy to listen to your story and, you know, your plan of action over some coffee. Perfect. Though, I preferred the idea of meeting at my place. I mean, that was the whole point, right? All I needed was an excuse. No, don't fall for it. The screen started glitching out just as I was about to say something. Ugh, 
threw it. I threw the nearest thing to me, a heavy book, at the wall behind my computer. Jacob, what's going on? Are you there? Yeah, I, I, I'm here. Sorry, Dora. I, I, I'm not entirely sure what's going on. I think someone's hacked my computer or something. Why would anyone do that? I hesitated. I had some ideas, of course, but, well, I was not going to tell her any of them. For once, no clever lie rose to my lips, especially not when I caught the terrified look Dora was finally giving me. What? What the? I only saw her for a second. By the time I whirled around to see what Dora had noticed before me, it was gone. I'm sorry, I... (sighs) I should have known this was going to be some sick prank. I bet you're going to post it all over the internet, you... No, you don't get it. I... How did you know my brother's missing? That's not it. Stop it. Murderer. This time, we looked at the chat window at the same time. Dora's eyes widened as photo after photo loaded into it. All of my handiwork. Things I was proud of. Things I already wished I could do to Dora if she were to reject me after seeing my face properly for the first time. You sick. Before she could have said anything, Dora's face morphed into that of Emma's. She looked exactly like the time I'd last seen her. Eyes mad, terrified. Sorry, Jacob, but I can't let you taint another girl. Don't you remember what happened the last time you tried? I did. I still have a small scar on my face to prove it. Cindy, a woman I met off Omegle, seemed nearly possessed when she slapped me across the face the second she saw me. Wait. It's been you all along! You've been spoiling my plans! I won't let you hurt any innocent souls. I won't. That was the first time I was ever scared of my ex-girlfriend. I'd always had the upper hand with her. And, well... When I thought she was cheating on me, I made sure that she got the punishment she deserved. But then, why was she there, in front of me? I'm calling the cops. Things stood still for a while after that, as sirens filled the silence from outside. I realized that there was nothing I could do. Emma had found a way to outsmart me from beyond the grave. Though maybe that was for the best. Maybe I was too sick to meet others or even to repent. Though, if that was the case, I wouldn't have been placed in a mixed prison with a lot of beautiful women.